Good evening, everyone. Thank you for joining us tonight for our webcast, Helping Shelter Pets Find Health, Happiness, and Homes with Fear Free. I'm Jesse Guglielmo, Education Specialist with Maddie's Fund. Our speaker tonight is Dr. Marty Becker, who is known as America's Veterinarian. He has developed the Fear Free Initiative that aims to take the pet out of petrified by promoting a considerate approach and gentle control techniques used in calming environments. By attending this live webcast, you will be able to register for the Fear Free course with a 50% discount. The discount code will be emailed to you tomorrow, along with instructions on how to sign up. Please check your spam folder if you don't receive the discount code by the late afternoon. This discount will only be available to attendees of the live event and will expire on December 14th. Fear Free has also graciously offered 10 free scholarships for those attending tonight. A random drawing will be held to choose the winner. The winners will be contacted by email tomorrow morning. Before we start, let's talk about a few housekeeping items. Please take a look at the left side of your screen where you'll see a Q&A window. That's where you can ask questions throughout the presentation. Keep in mind that questions submitted late in the presentation may not be processed in time for a response so please get your questions in early. If you need help with your connection during the presentation, click the Help widget at the bottom of your screen. This presentation will be available on demand within 24 hours for online viewing. Dr. Becker, thank you for being here tonight. Oh, thank you, everybody. Uh, here I am up here, I have to say it, I have to say it. In Northern Idaho, ho, ho, where it is a blazing cold seven degrees tonight. But I've been uh, white hot excited about having the opportunity to talk to you. And I, and I thank all of you that, that care about pets, people, and those of you that are in the veterinary profession. You know, I was born and raised in Southern Idaho. When you think of Idaho, you think of Idaho potatoes. And yes, we grew Idaho potatoes. I remember early on, when I was very young, when the first time I got to bring a dog inside the house, it was a black Labrador retriever named Luke. And I asked Dad if we could bring it in, and it was a big snowstorm, and the snow was blowing horizontally across the frozen uh, potato fields of southern Idaho. And he got asked what these breeds are made for. You know, he can take the weather. Well, he resisted, and I persisted, and finally Luke, the Labrador retriever, came in the house, it was like he was on ice skates. He was on the linoleum of the kitchen floor. But uh, his tail started wagging, and it was hitting my – he did the lab leaner thing, and then he, he jumped up on the couch. He ran the room, jumped up on the couch like a, a crazed animal, and his little tail was beating this beat on the, on the side of the sofa. Boom, 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 as we got closer. And, well, Luke, like many pets that you remember, he made this migration from the backyard, the barnyard to the backyard to the back door to the bedroom. If you didn't grow up rural like I did, from the Sunday Project doghouse to the back door to the bedroom, or put it another way, from outside to inside to underneath. So I went to veterinary school, believe it or not, to become a dairy practitioner. And the first hour of the first day of veterinary school, Leo Bustad, the dean of Washington State University's College of Veterinary Medicine, gave a talk on the human-animal bond. And I found myself at the end of the, of the welcoming remarks, going from the back of the room to the front of the room to, to volunteer for the people-pet partnership that matched elderly people with homeless pets. So out went the dairy, in went companion animals, and not just companion animals, but working to play shelter animals. That was in 1976. When I graduated in 1980, and started practicing in southern Idaho in Twin Falls. The very first week of practice, some of you are, remember back in 1980, the parvo epidemic hit. And there was people, there was lines of people to come in to be vaccinated. And my, my partner hadn't had a vacation in five years, so he left and went on vacation, so I was by myself. But a, a gal came in, and she, was, she got very close to me and says, you've got to help me stop, Dr. Becker, what's happening in the local shelter. This lady was an ex-flight attendant named Bobby Wilberton, and uh, she said they're gassing dogs to death down there. I didn't even know what it meant, but there I was in 1980, and I went down to the shelter and saw them gassing dogs to death with carbon monoxide. And 
and decided, you know, this can't, this can't stand. We need to at least do this humanely. So in my, in my career now, since 1980, I've been involved with uh, shelter medicine. Uh, we all, every veterinary hospital I've had has had an adoption center for shelter pets. We'd work with the local city or state or county to showcase their pets. I'm on the board of three national organizations. I'm on the board of three local shelters. And I applaud you, any of you that work in the shelters for the incredible work you do. So let's talk about Fear Free. And, you know, my slogan for Fear Free is to, you know, if the pet could talk, what would she say right now? And the pet might say, you know what, I have arthritis. Give me something to knock me out before you stretch me out to take radiographs. Or, you know what, I am terrified of dogs. Can you put me in a place, can you have me in feline-only hours? Or that my stomach's upset because I'm so nervous. Can you give me something for an upset stomach? And uh, uh, so when you have that kind of mindset, the fact is they are talking. They're just not talking in English or Spanish or German. They're talking with their vocalization, with their uh, body positioning, with the, the way they're holding their ears or their tail. So you have to learn the signs of fear and anxiety and stress, and you realize you can move to reduce or remove fear, anxiety, and stress and increase calm and happiness. Those of us that are in a veterinary profession tonight um, that are, are veterinarians or technicians or work in the veterinary part of shelter and medicine will know this. We've had four previous major transformations in veterinary medicine. The first one was feline medicine. Uh, literally, it was, used to be dogs only, and you know, we started seeing, finally seeing cats in practice, so they weren't, cats aren't just small dogs. You know, they're different procedures, different medications, and so on. The second transformation was dentistry. And you see this cat here, you know, licking this, uh, this toothbrush, when I was in veterinary school, graduated in 1980, you know, we basically did ultrasonic cleaning and uh, left these pitted teeth, and now we're doing rin tin grin. You know, we're doing braces for malocclusion and root canals and crowns. And, you know, uh, periodontal disease is the number one thing we diagnose in veterinary medicine, so it's very, very important that we do that. Third thing was preventive care. Rather than treating accidents and illnesses, actually to prevent things with parasite control, vaccinations. And the last one is multimodal pain management. So I was actually taught, believe it or not, in 1980, graduating with the understanding from my professors that pets didn't feel pain. And if they did, it was good because they were less mobile and not going to chew the stitches out or walk on the leg we'd fixed. Boy, oh boy, can you believe it? How, how could we believe that? Of course, pets, animals have the same neurologic pathways we did, but we were taught they didn't feel pain. So if you're looking at the discussion tonight, do pets have emotions? Do pets feel fear, anxiety, and stress? Do pets feel happiness? Do pets feel love? Of course they do. And this is kind of inside the dog and cat's mind starting out, and we're figuring out that that uh, we have a major part to play if they're going to be emotionally happy or be emotionally damaged. Now, if we go to um, uh, the sheltering, you know, we've had three great revolutions in animal sheltering. The first one was cruelty prevention. And uh, uh, this is the earliest days of the modern humane movement about protecting animals, primarily horses and dogs, but other animals as well, from abuse and harm. I'm on the board of the American Humane Association and was involved with, you know, getting these cattle that were abused going from the, the, the trails from Oregon, or excuse me, from Oklahoma and Texas up to the slaughter yards of Chicago, also bringing war horses back in World War I. But think back to the book, the book Black Beauty, and that's part of that early revolution, cruelty prevention. The second revolution was spay and neuter. The huge decrease in shelter intake and euthanasia we saw from the 70s to the early 2000s was driven by the second revolution the widespread routine spaying and neutering of companion animals. The third one, and you have a lot to say about this, is no kill. Eventually, some enlightened leaders realized that it's ethically unacceptable to manage pet populations by killing animals that we just saw as excess. Not enough homes for all the animals. And they began to re-examine the programs and policies of the past and pave a way to the future where all healthy and treatable pets would live and thrive. Out of the cage, onto the couch. 
Well, I'm going to tell you the fourth revolution in animal sheltering is here, and it's fear-free. It's the next frontier, and for the same reasons why it's the next revolution in veterinary medicine. The, um, I'm waiting for this slide to come out now. When you look at this slide, I want you to think of that boy in, in Aleppo that was sitting on the back of that ambulance. That boy that was covered in dust that seemed, that seemed to be almost like one of the people you find in Pompeii that's cast in ash, not moving. That boy in Aleppo is the same as the dog that walks into the exam room and lays down and acts like it goes to sleep or is in the shelter and it comes in and it lays down like it's going to sleep or it's the cat that's frozen uh, in the cage or frozen on the exam table. That is not relaxed. That dog that is sitting there with his eyes closed seeming to go to sleep when it comes in, I used to think that was relaxed. Actually, Actually, that's what we call collapsing immobility. Now, evolution has endowed humans and other mammals with a continuum of innate, hardwired, automatically activated defense behaviors, which is termed the defense cascade. And the defense cascade includes arousal. If you were to hear a gunshot now, or I even go, ah! is arousal. Next is fight or flight, then tonic immobility, and finally collapsing immobility. That's the response of last resort to an inescapable threat when active defense responses have failed. So no, the, the cat that's frozen, the dog that's in there that seems relaxed is the same. Think of it as that poor boy that I can't get that image out of my mind from Aleppo. So how this got started for me, listen, I'm not Temple Grandin. Temple Grandin is on our Fear Free Advisory Panel. There's almost 200 people on the Fear Free Advisory Panel. It happened to be a board of veterinary behaviorist named Karen Overall that I heard talk about fear was the worst thing a social species could experience and it caused permanent damage to the brain. And Karen went on to talk about the development of maladaptive fear, how in animal care we were causing repeat severe psychological damage to pets. This was in shelters, this was training, this was grooming, this is in the veterinary hospital. And in talking about this, you know, not, none of us, nobody that's hearing this or is going to view this later gets into uh, taking care of animals because we want to make life worse for animals. I, I was sickened that day, uh, you know, in 2009, thinking about that we were causing repeat severe psychological damage to pets. And in that time, yeah, I look back at, at, at my experience with veterinary medicine, and we just auger pets through the system or auger pets through the shelter, get them in, get them out, do the treatment, get them out, find them a home, you know, bring them in, make sure they're healthy, get them back out, without regard for their emotional well-being. So that's basically what fear-free is. In one hand, you have physical well-being. In one hand, you have emotional well-being. And coming down the, the trail in a little bit, we also got to start looking at enrichment activities for these pets. You know, when you talk about what is fear, anxiety, and stress, um, it's, kind of a, it's kind of a thing, even veterinary behaviorists. So on this fear-free advisory panel, there are 40 boarded veterinary behaviorists. There are a, an amazing group of people ranging from the head of uh, animal cognition at Duke, the head of animal cognition at Columbia University, Temple Grandin, medical minds in veterinary, in veterinary medicine, because besides being the right thing to do, to look after pets' emotional well-being, we can practice a lot better medicine. There's five boarded anesthesiologists. There's 14 boarded behavior techs in, in uh, behavior. So I'm not Temple Grandin. Temple Grandin is a savant. She's got a special gift. I'm a populizer. I'm an evangelist. I'm a gatherer of resources. I'm the most doggedly determined person you'll ever meet, but I'm, I'm really been able to showcase the breadth and depth of this incredible team. So basically, anxiety is a nervousness about what might happen. When you see this slide, there's no specific trigger. Ooh, that dark alley causes me to be anxious. Fear is to be afraid and worried and is re in response to a specific threat. When I looked down that dark alley, when I saw the people at the end of this dark alley who were carrying guns, I became very afraid. Now, fear can be in response to something painful or disturbing. 
Painful can include getting a flu shot or a blood draw, being stung by a bee, or hitting your finger with a hammer. Uh, next time you do a hammer, you hit your finger on a hammer, you have fear that you're going to hit your finger again. Uh, examples of disturbing would, would include somebody seeing somebody beaten up, witnessing a fatal car crash, seeing the body of that little Syrian boy floating in the waters of Greece, or that little boy that was sitting on the bumper of that ambulance in Aleppo, or I think in, for us, any kind of animal abuse that we have witnessed. And fear can be life-saving in the mode when you're fight, flight, fidget, or freeze. When fear is bad is when it becomes maladaptive fear. And then you have even more fear and anxiety in response to the same set of cir circumstances, and you don't even have to experience them. Let me, let me give you an example of that. My older sister, Cheryl, used to have her ponytail jerked by the dentist, Stan Kern in Buell, Idaho, to get her to keep her mouth open. My sister became a physician and a very well-known physician, a graduate of Yale, but didn't seek dental care her whole life because of the fear that she had, that maladaptive fear. But guess what? My sister Cheryl could decide not to go to the dentist. She didn't have to face the fear trigger. Pets are like children. They don't go to the dentist by free will. They don't go to the doctor, the veterinarian by free will, so they can't escape the fear, anxiety, and stress. For humans, if you like scary movies or scary rides, you go on them. If you don't like them, you don't go on them. Uh, I like doing crossword puzzles. My wife likes Sudoku. And you know what? If you get too anxious or fearful, you can put it down. But when a pet is feeling fear, anxiety, or stress, because they're coming in to, uh, uh, you know, not on their own volition, they can't get out of the fear. This probably sends shivers. Matter of fact, let's do a little, a little poll here. Send a pulse check. How many of you, it sends shivers up your spine thinking that you're going to go to the dentist. I'd like you to hit the thumbs up. And those of you that don't mind going to the dentist, you can hit the thumbs down. Well, you can see here, there's not too many of us that are hitting the thumbs down, the thumbs down here. Most of, oh no, it's catching up here now. So there's, uh, gosh, we've got a nice crowd on the line here. So it's about, it's getting close to, close to half and half. About, uh, about half uh, don't like to go a little more than that and half not mind. Well, I tell you what, remember my sister Cheryl that got her ponytail jerked? She sat in this little room with a little sink with swirling water. She listened to the drill, the belt-driven drill. She had, had her, the, the doctor hoovering over her, the dentist with no assistant. Contrast that with my granddaughter, Reagan. She goes to the dentist, and she sits in something that looks like a heated catcher's mitt. She can have a heated blanket on her if she wants. She gets to pick the color of the LED lights that are above her area. She gets to choose what's on the video screen, SpongeBob or Frozen. And then she has noise cancellation headphones and a glare glasses. When she gets done, she goes to an area that looks like Oriental Trading Company set up a retail outlet for toys, not the, the little tube of toothpaste or floss and a toothbrush of our past. And while she's getting it, my granddaughter Reagan gets compliment, or my, grand, my, my daughter Mikkel gets complimentary neck and shoulder, shoulder massages. So what a difference. So what is this amygdala anyway? It's this small almond-shaped body part. It's situated right in the front of the brain's temporal lobe. And scientists have associated the amygdala with negative primal behaviors such as fear and rage. And once something gets in the amygdala, it never, ever leaves. I'll give you an example. I told my son, Lex, well, the talk about, about age 10, I said, listen, if a female ever asks you, do I look fat in this, your response is never yes, because they're going to remember that. I remember uh, my knee getting crushed in football. I remember my heart broken by a girl in college. I remember facing a youth mob in Spain. I remember my granddaughter with RSV virus. I remember um, my mom and dad arguing about getting divorced. Um, a matter of fact, I remember uh, this Thanksgiving because we totaled our Subaru hitting a deer. So I'm never going to forget that as well. So the things that happen, a dog that gets its nails trimmed too short, a cat where a vaccination goes wrong, a pet that is not put in the proper cage or treated for anxiety and stress, somebody that tries multiple times to do a blood draw and misses, a dog that has a sore ear that's not treated, all those things go into the amygdala and cause fear, anxiety, and stress. Now, I want to 
it's really funny in a veterinary crowd, we ask uh, if you'd rather have permanent physical or permanent emotional damage of your pet. So this pet here, you can't tell by the picture, but this dog has one eye and three legs. There's always somebody in a veterinary crowd that has a one-eyed, three-legged dog, almost always if you get over 100 people. Uh, I'd be interested to see if we, if we take more time, how many of you have a pet that has uh, physical damage? We don't care if one of our pets lost an eye. We don't want them to, but if they lost all their teeth, lost their eye, uh, had one ear bitten off, had lost a limb, that's okay. You know, they don't mind it. But permanent emotional damage, that's what we don't want. Extreme separation anxiety. Extreme fear of going to the veterinarian. And what happens is the pet just doesn't go to the veterinarian. Instead, they go to the pet store and will buy a $100 bag of food, thinking it's going to take care of skin problems, ear problems, anal gland problems, tear staining, dental problems, even cognition, because the pet likes to go to the pet store. They like to take it to the pet store but the pet doesn't want to go to the vet and the people don't want to take it to the vet. So, you know, those of you that are watching this right now, you look at that, you know the thing. The music's already started in your head. You're on the boat. You're going to this nation. You're going to that nation. You don't have to think about being happy. You don't have to think about smiling. Every time I type a smiley face on a text message or something, I smile just type in a smiley face. Dogs don't have to think to wag their tails or cats to purr. You know, when we're happy, the corners of our mouth turn up, a dog's tail starts moving from side to side, and the cat's diaphragm starts moving at 25 times per minute in a percussion. I, you know, I think about what makes humans happy, being at Disney World with a child or grandchild, school plays, snow days where we live, grandma's favorite dish, fishing with grandpa, ice cream, chocolate, candy stores, toy stores, ooh, family reunions or not. And one thing to think about is, is that postures change emotions. Smiling has been shown to increase positive emotions. There was a book by the Harvard professor talking about the Wonder Woman pose. It's what we talk about in having a happy childhood, a happy marriage, living in a happy home, and loving what you do at work. This is one of my fa dad's favorite sayings. You can't wake up on both sides of the bed. Another one example, you also, you can't love your neighbors yourself but ignore the hobo that lived in an old school bus near our family farm. So we learn in church to love, you know, love your neighbors yourself. And there was a, there was a they, he was called a hobo at the time. He was somebody that's basically homeless that lived in an old school bus, basically in a, in a junkyard a buyer house, but we did love him and ask him over for Thanksgiving. In animal shelters and community outreach and in veterinary medicine, you can't proclaim, we care for pets and people, we love animals, and then ignore the emotional trauma that we know that we've been causing by what we've been doing or not doing. You know, simply put, and you look at this photo, this image, you're going to choose the upper path, and that will require acceptance, training, commitment, compliance, focus, and fervor. It's not the easiest path. It requires uh, acquiring a new skill set to be learned and implemented. But it's going to take you. It's going to take the pets under your care. It's going to take the people that work with you to the sunshine side of the mountain. And one thing about Fear Free, I'm here to tell you it's not easy. We're taking what 200 experts know. We distilled it down into these eight online modules. You go online. You can start or stop. You can go through one and a half and stop. You have to pass each module to go to the next module. So you can take two this weekend and wait and take three next weekend whenever you want. But once you're through all eight modules, then you become Fear Free certified. It takes nine to 17 hours. So it's not like some programs uh, that, that I, I support, like Cat Friendly. It's much more in depth than that. But, you know, we'd hoped we'd launch this thing April 1st and hope to have 1,000 people become Fear Free certified by the end of the year. And we're on track to have somewhere between five and 6,000 people registered for Fear Free certification. We're already over 5,000 right now. So I look at this image, and I, and I think about my North Star. Remember, I went to veterinary school to be a dairy practitioner, but I got touched by Leo Bustad, when Leo talked about um, 
the human animal bond and he'd been in Sobibor at a prisoner of war camp in World War II and man I was in. So based on his mentorship, his friendship, his teachings, I always wanted to celebrate, protect and nurture that special connection uh, between pets and people we call the bond. Also Leo Bustad was the first person to really look at the human animal health connection or the healing power of pets. Uh, that's one of the 25 books that I've written. But those, the bond, I love the bond, the celebration, protection, nurturing the bond. I so appreciate the human-animal health connection. But there's a new star in the sky, and that's the emotional well-being of pets and even pet owners. I think of, I think of fear, anxiety, and stress almost like a new disease that's been discovered that affects practically every, every pet. And it's up to us to learn the symptoms to learn the proven treatment plans and always have it in your peripheral vision. Always have physical well-being of a pet in one hand, emotional well-being of the pet in the other hand. And luckily, these experts that we have, the bedrock of Fear Free is boarded veterinary behaviorists, and uh, we're so lucky to be able to hitchhike on their education, their training, and their experience. So. Those of you that are, uh, have an, uh, a knowledge of veterinary medicine, whether as a provider or a, a consumer, I was taught in veterinary school, 1976 to 1980, that pets didn't feel pain, and if they did, it was a good thing because it kept them immobile. Oh my gosh, I think back of all the pets over this career now, so I'm up 36 years this year, all the dentals, all the tooth, tooth extractions, the ear crops I did, the uh, tail, the tail crops, uh, those things without any pain medication. Are you kidding me? Uh, it just, you know, I'm a guy. I'm a guy that if I got a cold sore in my mouth, it drives me crazy. And I think of all these pets that didn't have it. And we now know that train of thought was completely bogus. That pets have the same neural pathways as humans and very much experience pain. Well, once we accepted pain is real and damaging, we worked to prevent it from occurring and treat it if it occurred. We embraced a multimodal model of pain management. For example, with hip dysplasia, we might use a powerful analgesic, joint supplements, joint diets, product to improve joint health like Adequin, laser treatment, stem cells, physical therapy. I, you know, I've done stem cell therapy for, uh, for hip dysplasia. And Fear Free 2 is multimodal. It might include reducing visual stimuli for the pet, using pheromones, having the pet owner bring the pet in hungry, playing a special calming music on the way to the vet or in the shelter, giving chill pills or prescription sedatives for pets that, that have fear, anxiety, and stress, using new gentle control techniques, multiple, many ways to remove or reduce fear, anxiety, and stress. Thank you, Dr. Becker. Have... <laughs> uh, it looks like we've reached our first poll question. Uh, which of the following do you do in your shelter or practice? Please check all that apply. To give you a few more seconds to answer that question, I just want to remind everybody uh, to get your questions in early in the Q&A box on the left side of your screen. And please answer this question on your screen and not in the Q&A box. And here are our results. Isn't this interesting, Dr. Becker? That is really interesting. Wow. So uh, there's a lot of, uh, of veterinary healthcare professionals on here. Uh, you know, the part that's not applicable is very few, but, uh, you know, 77% for vaccination, 71% blood draws, 85% nail trims, 85.7% other procedures. Well, let's look at nail trims. It, it, what happens at a nail trim, typically, there's 250 to 500 pounds of people holding down a 10 to 30 to 40 pound animal to do a nail trim. Imagine you have a, an ingrown toenail. Can you imagine, Larry, Dan, Jim, Sarah, get in here. Let's hold Teresa down here and take care of this ingrown toenail. Oh my gosh. You know, think of the fear, anxiety, and stress you'd have before the procedure even started. And remember, uh, you know, fear can be caused by something painful or disturbing. You know, that is both. Now, at the hospitals that are fear-free, we do things completely differently. 
It may be a compression garment like a thundershirt that works. It may be uh, having pheromones that we wear on our uniforms that works. It might be a chill pill that we use like Soliquin or Zilkeen or Composure Pro at the right dosage uh, that works. And, and once you go through Fear Free Certification, two of those modules, two full hours, are on sedation protocols. We have the best sedation protocols in the world for pets now. And uh, most of them are very, are very safe, very powerful, very inexpensive. And so now at North Idaho Animal Hospital, where I work as an associate veterinarian now, most of the dogs that come in for, that already have damaged. So, you know, we don't want to start puppies and kittens off there because we can work with them to maybe never have to use sedatives. But most of the ones that are already damaged come in on trazodone, if they're a dog or gabapentin, if they're a cat. And rather than the cat being, you know, effed, you know, fight, flight, freeze, or fidget, it's like, hey, wow, far out, man. Wow, I like this place. It's like your college roommate that comes in, has gone for an hour. You don't know what he's on, but, man, he looks happy and calm. And it makes such a difference for these cats. The cat is happy. The pet owner is so happy they could eat a banana, smile and so why they could eat a banana sideways. You don't get the injuries. And you just feel so good because that pet is not stressed out. That dog might be on trazodone, and rather than taking them to the same door to the same spot with the same group of people that pile on that poor dog, we might have one person just go out while one person's trimming one nail at a time, the other person is shoveling in food rewards. So we have pets in Fear Free come in hungry so they respond better to food rewards. You're going to learn about a reward ladder in the Fear Free certification. You start out with things that are soft and chewable like, uh, like bacon strips or pepperoni or freeze-dried liver. If the pet doesn't want to take it or starts to slow down, you move right up to soft and chewable. Uh, when I worked at North Idaho Animal Hospital last week, it was hot baby shrimp, it was hot deli turkey, it was hot albacore tuna. And then the next step up the reward ladder is, is uh, moist and lickable. That's peanut butter. That is easy cheese, cheddar, and bacon. That's, that's what's in heaven, by the way, is easy cheese, cheddar, and bacon. I think that's what dogs find there. Uh, you know, when I was a, a little kid, I remember getting shots by something that looked like the, the, the tailpipe on a 57 Chevy. Oh, my gosh. I remember the doctor telling me to stand on that little step that was the end of, the, of an exam table. There was drawer, metal drawers on one side and a drawer on the end that had a handle. He pulled it out. It was a non-skid place to stand up. Told me to pull my pants down and lean across the table on that white paper that was on there. And he came at me with a glass syringe filling full of some white fluid with a needle that looked like a tailpipe and pushed me down with his left arm, hit me in the butt cheek with his right arm, injected this stuff, and I started screaming. It burned like fire. And my mom goes, shut up, Marty. That's the comfort I got in 1960. Shut up, Marty. You know, mom didn't want to embarrass herself. She didn't want to embarrass the, embarrass the doctor. So I, like many of you, as part of the human health care system, not health care, health care system of the 50s and 60s, when we, as the dependent beings in human health care, which is children, were manhandled, manipulated, threatened, and abused, our opinions were not asked, nor was our comfort or concern. And when my daughter, six-year-old or seven-year-old granddaughter Reagan started getting vaccinations, the only positive thing was letting her pick out the image of the Band-Aid. Now when Reagan has vaccinations or blood drawn or is vaccinated for overseas travel, one, they ask if you want to use a topical anesthetic. She doesn't have to even feel the needle. Two is distraction. Three is the promise of a really tasty treat, such as a cake pop, a deluxe sucker, or a box of animal cookies. So they use distraction. They use things so she don't feel the needle. They use a very sharp needle, so they draw the vaccine up with one needle and, and change it with a, uh, and then deliver the vaccine with another needle. Those of you that are doing vaccinations, there is a, um, a study in human health care. The number one thing people hate in human health care are needles. So this is vaccinations. This is blood draws. This is IV catheters. I have to get a blood test 
uh, now for cholesterol and heart medication. In fact, I'm going in tomorrow to get a blood test. And so when you go to the hospital now in my little hometown, you're sitting in this area where there's looks like leather wingback chairs with plants in between, and some happy person comes in and gives a talk and says, okay, boys and girls, I know some of you don't want to be here, but let's make it a great day today, and so I'll tell you what to do. And she basically says, listen, for all of those you don't want to feel the needle, we can put a topical anesthetic on now, and you won't even feel the needle. You know, how many want that? And everybody raises their hand. Two, when you start, those of you that get a little squeamish, when we get you in the chair, just start humming happy birthday to yourself. Let's practice. So she had us practice. And then she recommends you know, you don't look at the needle, you hum happy birthday to yourself. If you uh, start to feel anxious or you think you're going to be anxious, they'll give you something called panic peat, which is what kids of all ages use, and you squeeze it and the eyeballs pop out like a ooga, ooga kind of eye thing. So in veterinary medicine, you know, let's look at what we can do for pets. Don't think the pets don't, do not dislike needles as well. For 30 years, I was the veterinary Darth Vader. I wielded this lightsaber in the form of a syringe to frighten and attack. Of course, pet owners don't want to give their pets vaccinations, so I wielded my needle and syringe full of vaccine to project authority and to protect the pet. I draw the vaccine up in front of the pet owner. I tap the syringe to get rid of those deadly bubbles. I'd even squirt a little bit of that vaccine out for emphasis. Meanwhile, the pet would be watching the display like seeing a six-inch long bee stinger coming right at them. Now, the last seven years, we are providing a more comfortable vaccine experience. We use a line of vaccine, Beringer Ingelheim's half-volume vaccine line, an oral Bordetella vaccine. We use two needles, one to drop the vaccine and a new one to deliver it. The pet never sees the syringe or the needles. They're covered up under a towel that's impregnated with pheromones. So while somebody's using a distraction technique, for example, a pretzel stick dipped in uh, peanut butter or a pretzel stick that's covered with a little easy cheese cheddar and bacon, uh, one veterinarian I know writes the pet's name on the exam room table or the easy mat, writes the pet's name and lets the pet lick its own name off the pet vet mat while they're delivering the vaccine. So pretty amazing. The only problems I've really had now is people sometimes think you don't even vaccinate their pet because there's no reaction. I've even had people say, are you going to vaccinate my pet? I said, I did vaccinate it. Oh, no, you didn't. Yes, I did. And finally it goes back and forth, and I said, listen, I can't vaccinate it again. And so I would actually had to have them feel the lump on the pet because they couldn't believe that we would vaccinated it. The other thing that we've you know, routinely done in veterinary medicine that showcases for all to see the very worst of emotional trauma that we can afflict upon pets, and I think it nail trims and blood draws. And I'm going to add vaccinations. That's something shelter teams do a lot of, both in the shelter and in their community outreach programs. We can't uh, have 500 pounds of veterinary team members or shelter team members holding down a 20-pound dog or a 15-pound cat that dog or cat's in the fight or flight mode. They have superhero strength and they're fighting for their lives. So glands are expressed, bladder's empty, bowels evacuated as a pet struggles to breed with gauze or a muzzle typed around its snout or wrapped in a, in a towel. Imagine if you went to your local zoo and you got a peek through an opening in a door or a gap in the fence and saw the zoo personnel wrestling with an animal obviously in distress the smartphones had come out, you'd put it on social media, it'd end up on the nightly news, it'd end up on HuffPost, there'd be an outrage to close the place down, to fire somebody, to have their heads. But in fact, we do that with nail trims in shelters and veterinary hospitals all the time. When it comes time for a phlebotomy or a blood draw, we have a rookie or someone who's not very good at the task at hand attempt over and over, vein by vein, sometimes limb by limb, to find a quote unquote good vein to draw blood. Listen, my wife can hear me now and she hates it when I say this, but in the exam room, I'm gonna give myself a 10. I love pets and people. I'm a good diagnostician. I give a good physical exam. I know how to do fear free. When I walk out of the exam room and go in the back of the hospital, I'm a five. I'm average. When I go into the surgery room, I'm a two. 
so I don't do surgery. And so you want to have people in the hospital or people that work in the shelter that are the very best at doing blood draws to do the blood draws. It's not something that's just uh, done uh, by anybody, kind of a democratic basis. And I should have done this earlier, but I want to ask a pulse check here. How many of you, by a thumbs up, hate to take your own pet to the vet? And how many of you, by a thumbs down, like to take your pet to the vet? I'm going to add myself to the... So if you like to take your pet, to, if you, if you, if you uh, hate to take your pet to the vet, thumbs up. If you like to take your pet to the vet, thumbs down. I ask this in veterinary hospitals all the time. 80 or 90% of people hate to take their own pets to the vet. This is not something nebulous. This is not something we see every once in, a, once in a while. We don't even want to take our own pets to the vet. And this is also one of the reasons why people hesitate to visit shelters because they see what they determine to be obvious fear, anxiety, and stress. So I was taught my veterinary training in 76 to 80. I was taught how to restrain horses, cattle, pigs, dogs, birds, even primates. Restraint was designed to prevent movement and protect us at all costs. Any of you out there that are technicians, protect the vet at all costs. And I know today that restraint is a very poor word and an attitude to have. In Fear Free, we use the words gentle control. The late, the special Sophia Yin used low stress handling. Did you know we even know that dogs wag their tails higher to the right when greeting their owners and people they know very well? When dogs wag their tail to the right, they engage the muscles on the right side of their body more actively than those on the left. The left hemisphere is activated when the brain is processing positive experiences associated with emotions such as happiness, affection, and excitement, as well as something familiar. So it's kind of interesting. If you have a dog, whether it's coming into the shelter or one you've been working with at the shelter, and it's, it's wagging its tail more to the right, that's a good sign. On contrast, the right hemisphere takes precedence when processing sadness, fear, and other negative emotions and novel situations. And so um, you want to make sure that uh, if, if you're doing something that's wrong, they're going to have more of their wagging their tail to the left. By the way, there's also you'll learn in the Fear Free uh, online certification, dogs that are right paw preference. And the way you can tell a right paw preference is by filling a Kong with food and seeing which, which foot they hold it with while they lick. Dogs that are right paw preference are actually easier to train, easy, to, uh, easy for more successful adoptions, uh, and need less special care than dogs that have a left paw preference. But again, that's more of that is learned in the in the Fear Free uh, certification. And it um, looks like we've gotten to our second poll question. Did you have something else to say, Dr. Becker? No, I don't. <laughs> okay. So before I launch into this question, uh, I just want to remind everybody, I know some of you have been submitting questions, but make sure to get your questions in early, as questions coming in late might not have a chance to be processed in enough time to be responded to. Now let's go into our poll question. In your shelter or practice, are cats ever kept on the lowest level of a bank of cages? Please answer this question on your screen and not in your Q&A box. Now just one more time. In your shelter or practice, are cats ever kept on the lowest level of a bank of cages? Now let's take a look at the results. Well, what do you think, Dr. Becker? Oh, well, I'm, I'm a little concerned. And so of this saying, in your shelter practice, are cats ever kept on the lowest level of a base? So, so left kept on the lowest level of a bank of cages. So almost, almost a quarter, yes, or usually are always on the bottom. No, never is 7%. Only when we don't have room above, that's encouraging because that's 50%. And, and some are not applicable. But I'll tell you what, cats are, we, we have a, uh, a thing on this next slide that 
that really kind of tells us about this. But cats, they love to get high. And by the way, you're going you're gonna to think this is funny, like I did. We have learned so many little things in Fear Free that change everything. I learned six years ago that I was petting dogs wrong. How can somebody that Oz calls America's veterinarian, somebody that has loved pets his whole life, how could you possibly pet a dog wrong? But what I was doing in the exam room was bending down. Hey, Sparky, how you doing? When you get them up on the table, I'd pet them on the head. I might stroke them down the dorsal midline. They don't like that. They like to be uh, kind of scratched or petted on the side of the neck and the side of the chest. Cats, unless you're engaged or it's a third date, don't go below the neck. Under the chin, the lips, the hairless areas above the ears, they're special places that they like to be, like to be touched. I used to go in the exam room. I made the Walmart greeter seem like he was depressed. I was so energetic. I was taught this by my, my mentor. Show excitement. So I'd come into the room. Hey, Sparky, how you doing, boy? Go, oh, Sparker. Come see Dr. Becker. Sparky. I had even had a thing called a kitten mitten that looked like Edward Scissorhands that I'd go in there and, and try to engage a little kitten with. And I realized I was freaking these pets out now. Now they have to know ahead of time, but they're saying, that, you know, the, the nurse or the receptionist will say, listen, when you see uh, the veterinarians here, they're going to act very subdued, but don't think that means they don't like them. So they're probably going to do a very brief hello, but then they won't have interaction with your pet till your pet is ready to have interaction. So now Sparky's in the exam room. I walk in quietly. Hey, Sparky. Then I introduce myself to the, to the mom or dad or the kids. And then uh, I just throw a little uh, piece of deli turkey down. And then I'm talking about why they're into semen. I throw another little piece down. Now that dog is right there on, the, on my feet with its tail wagging, wanting interaction. Or that cat is looking at me and it's got that relaxed face and now you can have interaction, but always in the right places. So one of the things you learn, I've been in so many veterinary hospitals where the top small cages are filled with towels paper towels, supplies like IV fluids, and the cats were in the middle, even the lower cages, to their detriment. Listen, cats have a weird ecological niche, and when they're both predator and prey, and in that dual mode, they like to be up high to either look for supper or be safe from becoming someone else's supper. There's been study after study after study. Cats want to be the most prime real estate is the penthouse in those cages. And there are, if you have Snyder cages in your shelter or in your practice, uh, not uh, shoreline, excuse me, shoreline cages in there, there's some great cage covers that they have that are very inexpensive that slip right over the cage so it can be like privacy curtains or blackout blinds, and you can open up a little corner to watch them or anything. But, you know, dogs in nature, they're never elevated off their feet or put up on a surface that's slippery. And, and as such, most dogs like to be examined on the floor of the exam room or in a lap unless they've been conditioned to be on top of the exam room table. I'll give you a little primer here. There's a new exam room table that uh, is a fear-free table from Shoreline. Listen to this. This table has a built-in set of non-skid stairs. So on the end of the table is a little handle. You pull it down and these stairs come down. The pet walks up the non-skid stairs onto the table. The table, table has a stainless steel top with a slight rim, and you think, well, that doesn't sound fear-free. That's cold. That's uh, slippery. It's stainless steel. Well, hey, the whole surface is heated, and it has the ability to take a standard-sized bath towel and clamp it down on the table. So now it's non-skid. It's soft. It's warm. It's impregnated with pheromones, and the dog can walk up and walk down. So now when we use it, we got a new puppy, like I saw two of them last Friday. We just put a little trail of treats, and the pet just walks up one to the next to the next, and now it's up on the table. The second time we see this pet, it's going to run up on the table. Even for dogs that are terrified of the table, if we have them come in hungry and they they're, don't have fear, anxiety, and stress, we can counter-condition them to walk up the table. Now, here I am, and one of the things I want you to notice here, we've learned so much about Fear Free. Uh, when I uh, was practicing last, last Friday, I didn't look anything like this. And here's why I look different. You see that white lab coat? 
that causes fear, anxiety, and stress. I used to tell people to wear a white lab coat with a stethoscope around your neck because there was an increase in perceived client satisfaction. We knew that. It made you look like a doctor. Here's the problem. White is seen in a different spectrum by pets. It flashes and it causes fear, anxiety, and stress. You see that blue shirt I have on? That's a perfect fear-free color. The problem is it has stripes or checks on it. There's a term in, in the animal world called apostomatism, and apostomatism is the fear of stripes. Tigers have stripes. Coral snakes have stripes. Caterpillars have stripes. There's nothing in nature in stripes that is nice to them. So now I wore a blue shirt last Friday practicing, but it was a blue shirt that was just, just a color with no pattern whatsoever on it. But here's this dog. It's nice and relaxed on a, on a heated little towel there. You got your bacon strips. We got a, a product called Sense of Security. This is a product that Temple Grandin told me about. So a new puppy comes in for vaccinations. We give them one of these toys as part of the vaccine package. The first time it's filled with lavender. But after that, this is Linus's security blanket. We want the pet owner to take that with them to boarding, to the groomer, in the car when they go to pick the kids up from school. And it, it, what Temple Grandin has told me through Fear Free is that we're stripping familiar scents away from pets. And so I see a thing when even when pets that are, uh, you know, I've been in those sad situations to be in the shelter and watch that pet that was, you know, sleeping on the couch last night that's going to the cage at the shelter, to take their bedding, take their bed that they often give and put it in there with them uh, so that they don't have so much fear, anxiety, and stress. Uh, I don't wear any cologne. Uh, you'll get a kick out of this. I saw a, a, these two puppies last week, and before I went in to see them, I took a shrimp, I took some turkey, and I rubbed it uh, on my neck. I put it inside of my wrist there like you, you ladies put on cologne. And I went in there to see this one dog. His name was uh, Angel, a little miniature schnauzer. Cutest little thing. And I, and I devoided eye contact. I bent down sideways. You know, I, I threw some turkey down there, and then I bent down sideways, so I reduced my profile. Wasn't looking at him, but he hit me so hard, and he knocked me off my feet. And uh, they, oh, my gosh, I'm sorry, doctor. You okay? You okay? And I said, oh, that's okay. I says, I says, uh, uh, I sure love your little dog. And she goes, I've never, well, she said, I've never seen him react that way before. It's amazing. And, and uh, I didn't tell her that I had, was wearing shrimp and turkey. That's why the dog liked me so much. On needle size, I want you to draw the vaccine up with one size needle. We use a 22 gauge, and then we deliver the vaccine with a 25 or 27 gauge needle. You remember the super soaker days. When you use a super soaker, what do you do? You want to squirt it as fast as you can to make it spray far. When you're given a vaccine, you want to go slow, not fast, so you don't tear as much tissue. So if you were telling a diabetic that needle size doesn't matter, you know, again, you want to make sure that you're using a, a, a new needle to deliver, a sharp needle. Uh, you want to make sure that you're using a distraction technique. It's hidden under a pheromone impregnated towel. We see a pet coming in that's got a, a, a torn nail, or if a pet that's having a, has a bad reaction to vaccinations or IV catheter placement, we use a lot of lidocaine and prilocaine because we want to. We want to. Uh, there's no reason for that pet to have fear, anxiety, and stress from doing it. I'm going to skip this slide. You'll notice I'm using a product there called Zoom Groom. That product is created by uh, the Kong Company. And you notice I'm using it on the side of the chest there, side of the neck. There's my, uh, my nurse giving an oral kennel cough vaccine. I'll tell you how I can even ma make this. You know, we, it, I, if you want to see what fear, anxiety, and stress look like, I tell people, listen, go to one of the chain pet stores and look in the window of grooming. Those pets are so stressed, and they're looking at all these other pets coming in and these people coming in. And, and if you want to see fear, anxiety, and stress, give an internasal abortatella vaccine. 
Now, last Friday, uh, I have some great pictures of two little puppies they gave oral Bordetella to. Not only am I using the oral Bordetella, we put a little Easy Cheese uh, or peanut butter on the end of the syringe. You don't even have to hold it. The pet will just grab the syringe and suck the stuff right out of there because they're so uh, so excited about uh, tasting that Easy Cheese. What do you use for treats, by the way, for cats? Surprisingly, a lot of cats like green olives. We'll find about 20% of cats love a green olive. We give Bonita fish flakes. We give free-dried chicken hearts and green mussels, albacore tuna, fresh chicken, deli turkey, bacon, uh, turkey hot dogs, Gerber graduate meat sticks, easy cheese, and one that's really surprising is Vegemite. So I, I have to ask this. How many of you have tasted Vegemite and liked it, would you put a thumbs up? If you've tasted Vegemite and liked it, give me a thumbs up. If you have no idea what Vegemite is, you can give me, a, or hate the taste, you can give me a thumbs down. We're now at the point where uh, Alana Rodan, a feline expert, she has 85% of the cats in her practice take treats now. At the practices that are fear-free, I would say uh, like about 60% to 70% of the cats take treats. How is that possible? First of all, you don't have fear, anxiety, and stress. Oh, I love the results of this poll. 158 people either didn't like Vegemite or didn't know what it was. Only 18, and they must be from New Zealand or, uh, or uh, Australia. That is, uh, it's a fermented kind of a yeast, and it's, boy, it's a desired taste. Just like, they don't like peanut butter, and they like Vegemite, and we don't like Vegemite and like peanut butter. But now I'm letting this little pet just lick something off of my finger. You notice in the background there's a music player there that's doing this calming music called Through a Cat's Ear. It was developed by a veterinary neurologist, a bioacoustic expert, and a Juilliard-trained musician. Uh, there's a heated pads underneath that little baby blanket, and that baby blanket is in the colors that, that cats like. You know, it's so much easier to, uh, uh, you know, to, to get these pets to, to want to come into the veterinary hospital. And actually, we get now to where we have dogs. Most of the dogs want to come into the hospital. Two of the patients that I saw on Friday, they actually, uh, I got done and I went to the end of the, uh, to the counter to check them out, and I turned around and they weren't there. And I thought, where'd they go to? And I looked, and the, 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 um, the leash, they were standing outside the exam room, and the leash was going into the exam room. They couldn't get the dog out of the exam room. Now, instead of the dog coming in at, at, you know, at one speed and going out at another speed, it, was, it, was, it was, went in at warp 10 and wouldn't leave the exam room. It's looking around for another shrimp, another piece of deli turkey, some more easy cheese, cheddar, and bacon, or for the cat for another olive or some Vegemite. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and skip this one and go to our poll. Thank you, Dr. Becker. So our next poll question is, what methods do you use in your shelter or practice to control or restrain pets? Please check all the answers that apply. As we wait for you all to answer, I'm just going to repeat that question one more time. What methods do you use in your shelter or practice to control or restrain pets? Again, please check all the answers that apply to you. And now I'm going to show everybody the results. And we have our results, Dr. Becker. Wow. There we go. You know, the pile of text restraint, that's if I was just, to, if we were to take a bus, a tour bus, and just pop into a veterinary hospital or shelter, you know, so many of us would see multiple staff members in the pile of techs. I was in a hospital two days ago, and we were walked in the back. The veterinarian is very proud of his place, and all of a sudden I heard a technician go, watch it, he's going to bite, watch it, he's going to bite. And then another technician runs over, you know. Firemen aren't the only one that run into a fire in the veterinary profession. We try to run in and help restrain a struggling animal when, unless they're going to get loose, just let them go. Let them catch your breath, you know. Don't traumatize them. So about 50% do pile of techs, 19% catch poles, 
Uh, uh, 67 percent use the Pareto wraps. Again, we have a lot to thank uh, Sophia Yin there for, and you're going to learn a lot more of these when you take your fear-free certification. And the muzzles, and the one thing I want to stress here, you can have a muzzle in a fear-free exam. A muzzle does not, it doesn't equal a, a heart exam. As a matter of fact, we encourage the use of basket muzzles. So the pet can still breathe, it can still drink, you can still give, uh, you know, use a pretzel stick and give food rewards and stuff. So nothing wrong with a muzzle. And 55% here are using sedation. And this leads us right to our next, our next uh, uh, slide here. I used to think that yeah, there's an old saying, if you can't abate, you must sedate. We used to, the, the amount of, of sedation, prescription sedatives that we used before Fear Free, I could have put in a thimble. Now I, I, I could probably put it in a 55-gallon drum. And the veterinary, remember, we have over 50 boarded veterinary behaviorists and we have five boarded anesthesiologists. And what they say, think of sedation as a first option, not a last resort. Sedate early and often. If you can't abate, and that's anxiety and fear, you must sedate. You know, it's so much more important now to, to work together as a team to have a knowledge of the science, the, the skill of recognition and response, and medications to overcome the neurochemistry in situations that can't be controlled, and a commitment of belief in fear-free that is unshakable. One of the things you're going to learn in fear-free is going to learn a lot of fear-free, uh, the, the sedation uh, options, and they are exquisite. We have, again, two hours you're going to learn. And one of the things that I would suggest to you is have somebody go through it really quickly and become fear-free certified, and then take it as a team. So I like to have you take it as a team so you could do it one hour, uh, uh, you know, once a week or one hour every other week and take it together. Then you can talk about, you know, module one, by the way, is how to get a pet from the living room at somebody's house to the front door of the practice, whether they're walking there in the city or driving there. It involves them getting the carrier out a week before for a wellness visit. It involves a magic carpet ride of pheromones from carrier to car. Up here in northern Idaho, where it's seven degrees tonight, if I had to take a pet in or tomorrow morning when it's, I think, a high of 13, I don't take a cat from 72 degrees or a dog and then take them out to seven degrees or 13 degrees. You preheat or pre-cool the car. You have them come in hungry so they respond better to food rewards. You have the carrier flat and covered with a, a sheet or a towel to reduce visual stimuli. You not only don't baby talk the pet on the way in, you use the special calming music. When you get to the clinic, if it's a busy clinic and you can't be put in the exam room immediately, you can ask ahead of time or we'll tell you in Fear Free, come check in and then go back outside and wait with your vehicle uh, in the parking lot. So that becomes the, that becomes the de facto uh, Waiting room is just in your vehicle. And all those things definitely reduce fear, anxiety, and stress. Now, I want to ask you, I want to do a poll here. How many of you use a stethoscope in work? How many of you use a stethoscope? If you don't use a stethoscope in work, please do thumbs down, the red one. While you're answering here, we did an event. You know, I told you I'm on the board of three local shelters. Uh, I love our local shelters. I love the work that these people do. And we do something called Halloween Town every year as a fundraiser for them. And two kids came dressed as, uh, as veterinarians. What do you think they wore? They wore a white kind of a lab coat looking. They had a stethoscope around their neck. So it's almost equal here, 80, 80 of you. Um, 84 use a stethoscope, 103 don't use a stethoscope. But you know a stethoscope, if you think of veterinary medicine, the exam room, the exam room table, and the stethoscope are the most iconic items that you have in, 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 uh, in veterinary medicine. Think of this stethoscope. And both I ask veterinarians, where do you keep your stethoscope? It's on a hook, it's in a drawer, it's in their box, it's in uh, laying on top of their desk, and guess what? 
I, when I ask him, who's in charge of cleaning your stethoscope? Everybody laughs. Unless it was a communicable disease, if it was influenza or it was parvo, it gets cleaned. Otherwise, never cleaned. Guess what's on that, uh, on that stethoscope? Fear, anxiety, and stress pheromones. And so it'd be like you'd have a, uh, um, somebody use a stun gun on you, and all of a sudden you hear or see a stun gun. I mean, this is the, the talk about triggering fear, anxiety, and stress in the worst possible way. So now these pheromones, when I get ready to leave to go to work, I spray myself with, with feel away and Adaptal, the dog pheromone and the cat pheromone. The cat can't smell the dog one, the dog can't smell the cat one, and the humans can't smell either one. But now what we do is I take that stethoscope, and after every exam, it's wiped down with um, uh, a product called Rescue. And I know a lot of you use Rescue or Excel inside the shelters, which I'm really glad of. And, uh, and then we wipe back across it with a species-specific pheromone. So no more fear pheromones on it. All they smell is their mother, like... Oh, wow, you know, oh, gosh, I love mother. The other thing is thinking about an otoscope. So a lot of practices, you know, the otoscope, they clean the, they clean the, they clean the, um, the, the cone or use new ones, but nobody ever cleans the battery pack. So now on the otoscope, the ophthalmoscope, after every use, it's all wiped down with rescue, this accelerated hydrogen peroxide, and then we wipe back across it with a pheromone. It makes such a difference. I had a pet last Friday that was a mama's dog, if you know what I mean. And before Fear Free, that dog would have struggled like a 30-pound salmon on six-pound line when she got ready to leave. But I know this pet's sensitive. And so the pet came in on, on a chill pill, and it was doing pretty good. But I went in the back and I reconned the route. I went back and I said, hey, Rocky Hayes is coming back. And, you know, that's that little Bichon that gets so uh, anxious when it's back here. Where's a quiet place that we can put it? Let's get the cage ready. So they got out, uh, out of our uh, uh, towel heater, towels that are already uh, heated and impregnated with pheromones. They made the cage. They put the shoreline cage cover on and said, I'm going to go get it. So when I went to pick it up, we know through Fear Free, through our considered approach and gentle control and gradient touch, we knew to have her set it on the table and turn it backwards to me. I picked it up. I said, let's walk to the door together, and then you just stop. So we walked to the door together, and when I got to the back, no clippers, no movement, no staring at, at Rocky, Rocky Hayes. We put it in the cage. It's bathed in the pheromones. There's the reduced visual stimuli because of the cage cover, and the dog was just fine. Some of these things are so simple that you, that you learn as part of Fear Free. So you know, what are happy sounds? I don't know if any of you grew up rural like I did, but I love baby chicks in the spring. I love a gospel choir. I love cheering at a game, a slot machine paying off, a baby ooing and eyeing their children laughing, a cat purring, a dog playing, the sound of your own name. What are unhappy sounds for humans? Screams, wailing, gunshots in an unexpected place, the crack of thunder that's too close, a siren, a whistle when you're in play, painful moans, whimpering, a vicious growl. For me, uh, the sound of that airbag going off on Thanksgiving night when we totaled our car on this poor deer, uh, I feel for it. But, and some sounds that can be positive to one person and negative to another. I'm going to use a term right now you probably haven't heard for a while, a wolf whistle. Matter of fact, we just as well ask it if we're going to have a little fun. How many of you tomorrow would like to go to work and hear a wolf whistle? If you hear a wolf whistle, give me a thumbs up. If you don't want to hear a wolf whistle tomorrow or any time the rest of the year, give me a thumbs down. So we're at about 50% of people answered, and 48 wanted a wolf whistle and 100 and 108 don't. So about two-thirds uh, don't want it. So you know what? That's, uh, uh, it's, that's what you find out about Fear Free. You try what you learn in Fear Free that works best, 
and then you start personalize it to the pet. Okay, this dog does better if it goes straight into the exam room. This cat or this dog gets freaked out when it gets weighed, so we're not going to weigh it. This dog uh, d gets freaked out when we take its temperature. If it's in for a wellness exam, we're not going to take its temperature. This is the hospital team of the individuals the pet likes best. This is where it's examined. This is the treat it, treats it likes best. This is the medication that works best. And so now you start to get an emotional record and a medical record. And Fear Free is working with the major software companies, so next year it's going to be very easy to have those things in place where right now you have to put them in special notes. One thing you don't have to do, you know, we're working, our goal is to create a Fear Free shelter. Next year our focus is out to the public on creating Fear Free homes. We're working now on creating Fear Free veterinary visits. Uh, we have some incredible sponsors that we're working with to bring this message. You know the old commercials for Dell computers when you say Intel inside and you hear the dun 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 dun? Or S. E. Johnson, a family company where the screen wraps up on TV in the in the bottom right hand corner. We're gonna have that with fearfreepets.com. People will be coming there to find a fear free uh, veterinary hospital, a fear free veterinarian or technician, a fear free shelter, a fear free groomer. And with, uh, I, I'm not going to mention, they're, they're very large uh, uh, consumer companies that are going to be doing advertising on our behalf and helping us to promote. And the largest companies in, in the veterinary profession, Zoetis and Beringer Ingelheim and Siva and Virox and them are all sponsors. So uh, we really want to you know, tell people, listen, if you're going to do this, you don't have to remodel your practice. You remodel your voice and your animal handling procedures. All that we did at North Idaho Animal Hospital, we changed out the fluorescent lights uh, for LED lights. There's a harmonic in a, in a fluorescent light that's disturbing to pets, and we just changed the colors of the exam rooms. I'm going to talk about that in a minute. When you look at what's happy, you know, we talked about what's happy sounds for humans, you know, slot machines paying off applause. What's happy sounds for pets? It might be their buddy down the street barking hello, shoeys going on feet and a leash coming off the wall, food being prepared, the refrigerator or treat door being open, dishes set for a meal or hearing prayers, the can open or the whoosh of a pop-top can, mice or squirrels. What are they not like? Thunder, 4th of July, gunshots, almost any sound at a veterinary hospital. So we have to work at removing or reducing as many fear and anxiety triggers as we possibly can. One of the things you've learned, and in, in we've learned as part of Fear Free, tell you what, white is terrible, stripes are terrible, black is not well, dark colors. If it looks good on an Easter egg, it looks good to pets. You want to have pastel blue, pastel green, pastel purple, a, you even have a pastel orange or pastel yellow. You definitely don't want to have those those uh, other kinds of colors because we've always picked stuff up in the in the past. We just wanted something that uh, you know we thought was durable and looked good to look good to humans. And one of the things you've got to do is you've got to have a coordinated effort. You can't have one person doing the splits while another team member is doing a high kick. Everybody must be using the same playbook when it comes to creating a fear-free veterinary visit or a fear-free shelter experience. For example, you can't have the receptionist and the technician speaking with their inside voice in a very nice, calm manner, and then have the veterinarian burst through the door, march right up to the pet, and start bending him like she's going to do a chiropractic maneuver or they're on the Cirque de Soleil on Fluffy. Every team member in the shelter, every team member in the hospital must make Fear Free a priority. They must understand what a calm, anxious, and fearful pet looks like. They must understand what a calm and happy pet looks like. They need to speak softly. They need to minimize chaos. They need to feed treats freely. They need to hold gently and always keep the pet moving away from turbulence and towards calm waters. When we practice at uh, North Idaho Animal Hospital. Again, I've, I've owned or co-owned seven veterinary hospitals in my life, and now I work as an associate veterinarian. But at every moment of truth, we think, let's practice like the pet owner is right there looking over our shoulders. And I think in a shelter, let's, let's run the shelter 
like the adoptive pet owner is right there looking over our shoulders. If the pet owners could watch this live, if the potential people adopting pets could watch this live, what would they think? How would we take that pet out of the cage? What would we do if a pet was in a mess? If a pet was crying with fear, anxiety, and stress, and it was their pet or the potential adoptive pet, would we ignore that? And we talked about this earlier. If the pet could talk, what would she say right now? When I talk to you about Fear Free, I want you to just do one thing different for a week. When I first started this uh, with Fear Free, there's been two times, I'm a person of faith, and there's two times when I just had to thank God. One was when Temple Grandin joined. I have learned so much from her through this. Of course, the Board of Behaviorists. Of course, the animal handling experts from zoos that taught elephants to present their ear for an ear exam, or rhinos to present their feet for a hoof trimming, or orangutans to, prevent their, to present their cephalic vein for a blood draw. They're teaching us how to teach dogs to present themselves for an otoscopic exam. Those two dogs I saw last week, a little lab puppy and a little schnauzer puppy, both of them, I let them sniff the, the, the otoscope. And remember, it was wiped down with rescue and wiped back across with pheromones. Got a treat. Put the stethoscope by the ear, treat. Insert it into the ear, treat. Do the same thing on the opposite side. Took 30 to 45 seconds. When we see those pets again and they see that otoscope, they're going to sit there and line up to have the otoscope used. Now in puppy classes, and if you're teaching any of those in the shelters, not just basic behavior and socialization, sit, stay, and play, let them smell a thermometer and they get a treat. Now lift up their tail, get a treat. Work in pairs, and you touch their, their anus with a Q-tip, treat. You dip it in KY jelly and insert it, treat. You let them smell a syringe, treat. You pull up a fold of skin over the shoulders, treat. You switch out for a ballpoint pen and put pressure, treat. And then you, um, you um, uh, dip it in KY and insert it and they get a treat. And then they're on the scale and they get a treat. And so you start to condition or counter condition these pets uh, to want to have their temperature taken, to want to be vaccinated. Um, and I, I misspoke a little bit on the vaccinations again. After you do the, you pull the skin up over the shoulders and give them a treat, you switch for a ballpoint pin and give a treat. Then you lift up the back leg treat, put pressure with a ballpoint pin treat. Now they're conditioned to want to have the thing done. But so don't get overwhelmed with what I'm talking to you about tonight. When I met a, there's a person named Steve Ettinger, and let me do one last pulse here, and then I'm going to wind this thing down so we can answer your questions. How many of you know who Dr. Steve Ettinger, the veterinarian, is? If you know who he is, do thumbs up. If you don't know who Steve Ettinger is, you put thumbs down. So about uh, one-third of you know who Steve Ettinger is. Now it's getting close to half of you know who Steve Ettinger is. Steve Ettinger is the most widely known veterinarian in the world. I was recently at the World Small Animal Veterinary Medical Association, and in Cartagena, Columbia, there's veterinarians there from 60 countries, and most of the people in the room when I asked knew who Steve Ettinger was. He is the author of Veterinary Internal Medicine, and when Steve, Steve I talked to him about five years ago, Dr. Ettinger, and uh, he got really moved when I told him about Fear Free, and I, I couldn't figure out why it was emotional, and he told me, for the last year, he'd been working in a facility in California that had uh, a, a, a veterinary rehab facility in one area and a traditional veterinary hospital in the other area. When people pulled in, if they went to the traditional veterinary hospital, the resting heart rate of the dog was 140 to 150. If he went to rehab, it was 90 to 100. Fear was 50 to 60% higher with fear, anxiety, and stress in um, it just going to, to the traditional veterinary hospital. He called it Fear You Can Hear. And so guess what? There's an a, a activity tracker called uh, Voice, and they have two to 300,000 dogs. The average resting heart rate at home is 50 to 55. That's all. So 50 to 55. So we know what's Fear You Can Hear. Let's go to... Um, 
let's go to uh, real quick. We're doing a book. You know, Fear Free program is going to become like the Susan B. Komen. It's going to be uh, a very well-known consumer brand. It's going to bring a lot of people in. It's going to really increase adoptions. It's going to increase visits to veterinary hospital. I'm sitting here working. Uh, we're working right now on my 25th book. It's called From Fearful to Fear Free. I'll let you read this slide while I'm talking. Uh, From Fearful to Fear Free is written with two boarded veterinary behaviorists and my daughter, Mikkel, who's a well-known trainer. But we need your help. We've got to get these people when they, you know, first of all, I, I want to seek your help in making a shelter experience better for pets, that you too don't just look at physical well-being, but look at emotional well-being, that you learn the signs of fear, anxiety, and stress. You learn what some of the fear and anxiety and stress triggers are in the shelter and move to remove or reduce them, that you learn different animal handling procedures. You learn how to do a considered approach where you don't, walk up to a pet and bend over it, that you turn sideways and you offer your hand, that you, uh, when you go to touch a pet, you don't just pull up a fold of skin, you do what we call gradient touch. You touch with one hand, tint the skin, and touch with the other hand, tint the skin. The second or third time you tint the skin, that's when you deliver the vaccine. So you're looking at, at Fear Free, Again, you get nine hours of race-approved CE. You get an implementation guide. You know, I don't need to go through all these things, but I, I think some of the really cool things is we have a toolbox. Once you become certified, once you do those nine to 17 hours of uh, and become fear-free certified, there is a rich area. It just opens up uh, to you. So if you have any kind of questions, uh, on on uh, you know how to implement this, how to do how to handle aggressive patients, how to uh, you know change the 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 setup in your cat ward. That stuff is all available there. There's uh, also an implementation guide that covers leadership and operations and human resources. There's an educational library that has videos and articles and scientific publications. We add resources weekly. In this toolbox are client education tools, social media and marketing tools, press release templates, training materials. We have monthly podcasts that feature fear-free professionals uh, with topics that include fear-free in your, in your practice or shelter, client communications, marketing tips. We have an online community with a private Facebook group. We have a monthly e-newsletter and a list of certified professionals. Again, this thing, when we started this, we were hoping hoping, hoping to get a 1,000 people to become fear-free certified by, um, by the end of this year in nine months, and we're going to end up five to 6,000 individuals. This is the greatest transformation in the history of veterinary medicine. And, you know, I thought this was starting out to getting fear-free veterinary visits, but I realized as I got into this that really none of the people looking after animals were that were, were new enough about emotional well-being. They were being traumatized in shelters, being traumatized just going to, to Starbucks if they, were, if they were fearful and anxious to go there was not a treat for this dog. Uh, these trainers that, you know, anybody can say they're a trainer, but so many of these trainers were causing fear, anxiety, and stress. So in the dream of this group of 200-plus people, in the dream of the, of the allied partners like Maddie's Fund, uh, in the dream of the animal training community, we want to have pets adopted from a fear-free shelter that live in a, in a, in a fear-free home, that go to a fear-free veterinarian, that are referred to a fear-free groomer, fear-free trainer. And I tell you, the greatest things are yet to come. All of us that often got into this profession starting out when we were very, very young are going to find a new kick in our step. We're going to find a new level of energy we thought we never had when we look at creating fear-free life for all pets. So I'm gonna end there and take a few minutes. Um, we have six dogs, by the way, now. We just drove to Rapid City, South Dakota and picked up two dogs that uh, were adopted from a shelter in Kansas City. So we may have to change uh, Animal uh, Almost Heaven Ranch to Almost Hoarder Ranch, but we love all of these pets. and. I really hope that some of you were moved like I was when I first heard this message from Karen Overall, that your life was changed. 
and you now have a commitment to helping pets live happy, healthy, full life. Thank you so much, Dr. Becker. That was a fabulous presentation. I know that we are running up on the end of the mark time, but we do want to go over just a few minutes so that we can try to answer as many questions as possible. So we hope that all of you can stay with us for that time. So let's start with our first question. Does Fear Free take longer in the exam room? How do you balance this so your practice can make money? It takes longer for the pet owner and the pet, but the same amount of time for the, the healthcare team. So at North Idaho Animal Hospital where I practice, cats, we put cats in the room, we put the carrier on the floor, we put a little piece of honeysuckle wood down there and a little catnip toy and maybe some tasty treats and we leave for 10 minutes. And so they're listening to this calming music. They're taking in the pheromones, they're relaxing into the room. For dogs, we do it for five minutes. But then when we come in, the, the technician and the veterinarian, it's still, I'm still in there 15 minutes. And it actually takes less time because there's not so many struggles for, there's not restraint. These pets are calm, these pets are happy. Um, like Ettinger found out, you know, next year Steve Ettinger is giving uh, a bunch of talks on why Fear Free is better medicine. The TPR is more normal. The blood pressure is more normal. The physical exam is more normal. The blood chemistries are more normal. So these practices that are, there's three reasons to do Fear Free. Number one, it's the right thing to do. You know, we, we took a pledge to prevent or relieve animal pain and suffering, not cause it. Number two, it's better medicine. It's better for the, the health, you know, the physical well-being of pets and our job as veterinarians. And number three, it is financially rewarding. The practices have been doing this are seeing significant growth. Great answer, Dr. Becker. Uh, we're going to be moving on to our next question now. Can treats be used before surgery? Oh, I love this. I love this. I love this. I love this because we're working on this right now. We were taught, remember, I was taught in 1980, pets don't feel pain, and if they do, it was good. Uh, oh, I just think back of all these different things these pets have suffered. Okay, we were taught, don't have pets eat or drink after midnight, and now we're finding out that that is wrong. On the human side, there's a whole bunch of studies that show that, it's, that people shouldn't fast, they should have a small meal. Remember, we have over 40 boarded behaviorists and five boarded anesthesiologists. All five of the anesthesiologists uh, say it's okay to give treats before surgery. And in fact, with a lot of these pets that are coming in that we know are gonna have surgery, we actually have the, the pet owner give a small amount of food, say a cat with a little tiny package of Fancy Feast and those little foil packets with some 40 flora, with some gabapentin, or for the dog, a, a tablespoon or a feud with 40 flora and trazodone. And uh, most of us are now using Serenia to stop, um, you know, vomiting anyway. But even if you have a pet come in for a wellness visit and you, have, you give some treats and then you sedate them or do anesthesia, uh, the five boarded anesthesiologists are trying to get that, uh, you know, where we just, we forget about this, the, the starvation thing and realize that you can give treats, you can give a small amount of food and actually have a better anesthesia experience than having them coming in fasted. Great, thank you again. Um, we're gonna be moving on to our next question. I had a very frightened and aggressive 14-year-old kitty that I saw for the first time last week, and I wanted to send her home with gabapentin to make future visits less stressful, but the owner said no. What do you do? Well, when you start Fear Free, I will tell you, let's say at North Idaho Animal Hospital now that uh, if it's a new puppy, we don't use trazodone. If it's a dog that has been traumatized before at our hospital or somebody plays else at home with a nail trim, they're, on, they're on, gonna be on trazodone. Uh, we, try, we try something more simple first. And for this pet owner, rather than gabapentin, you, we might try Soloquin or we might try Zilkeen or might try even a Thundershirt. A Thundershirt's work on a lot more cats than, than you would ever think. Uh, just don't put it on too tight to start with. Uh, the calming music really helps. But you're gonna have people 
that you say, listen, we're not going to have five people hold your dog down anymore to trim its nails. You'll have some people go, well, yeah, we need to sedate it, or we need to give it a chill pill or need to sedate it, and, and they'll go, no, just like this, this cat. I don't want to do it. I never had to do it. Doc Blank didn't do it. Uh, I'm not going to do it. Well, I used to do convenience euthanasias, and for the people that don't know that, when I first started in practice, people could just bring a dog in and want it euthanized, and we'd euthanize it. I, don't, I did ear crops, and I hate, I hate the fact that I ever did ear crops. Uh, we used to not give pain medication, and we give pain medication now before, during, and after surgery, so we change. The good news is for everyone that leaves that has that kind of attitude, there's 50 take, your, take their place that had stopped coming to the veterinary hospital because it was so stressful for the pet. There's a study out that shows the number one reason people stop to, are taking pets to the vet less often is stress to the pet, number two is money, and number three, stress to the owner taking the pet to the vet. So be prepared to lose some people. Be prepared to gain a lot of people. But even for that cat, you could try a calming diet or try one of the more natural products or approaches. What great questions we're getting. Okay, so next. I work at a shelter. Most of the pets that I handle, we don't know medical history, and they may be dangerous. Can Fear Free help them also? Again, I, I can't thank you. I, I mean this. I, I would give all of you a hug, uh, however many hundreds of people are on here that work in shelters. I love you people. I support you every way I can. I, I pray for you. I love you. Um, one of the things you're going to learn about this program, you're going to realize there's a whole different world out there that you didn't know existed. I, you know, I, I'm not ever want to act like I'm talking down to people or that I have some special gift. I don't. I had that awakening in 2009, and I had to learn the signs of fear, anxiety, and stress. Now it's just second nature to me. I, I can tell, I can see it. I, I can, you know, when, when dogs have a yeast problem in their ears, you can, it smells like most people can smell popcorn at a movie theater, you know. Uh, that when a dog has ear problem, they have their ears tipped. It's, it, you know, tipped down to one side usually. You see if they've been licking their paws, it's saliva stained. You will get so good at knowing the signs of fear, anxiety, and stress. And you've got to learn the things that you have to do to change it. You can't have a, 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 a smock on or a coat on that has an animal pattern or a lot of stripes on it. You can't have a cat an exam room in the clinic that has a lot of pictures of cats on it. You need to be wearing pheromones. You need to be using gradient touch. And so on the, on the medical things, there's nothing wrong with a basket muzzle. If, if a pet comes into me, and we didn't have the advantage of them getting the lecture ahead of time about what they need to do. It just shows up, and I'm worried about it being uh, aggressive. We, we will take steps to protect ourselves as well, and it's probably going to be putting a basket muzzle on, but it's going to be lined with easy cheese. And the, the sedation protocols that are part of Fear Free, the things that we use, there's every, it's like, uh, you know, A to Z. There's every kind of sedation protocol you can think of, including some, even with an unknown medical history that are very, very, very safe. All right, let's take our next question. Our shelter transports many cats in a van to the spay and neuter clinic. Any recommendations on how to reduce stress when there are many animals together in kennels in a van? Yeah, the, the first thing I would do is try to try to reduce visual stimuli. So I would just use towels or sheets to cover each cage so that they reduce visual stimuli. I would have a pheromone dispenser in there if you could, if there was a plug-in. If not, there uh, the Siva rep, the company Siva, has these these things there. You can actually buy them like at CVS or Amazon. They're like an incontinence pad for humans but you just spritz it with the species-specific pheromone and have it at the bottom of the cage. And there is a new product out by SIVA, uh, and I, I want to tell everybody, there's nothing I've mentioned tonight that I have a, a relationship with, a product that I, that I have a relationship with. So SIVA has a new product called Feel Away Multicat. Uh, Adaptal, the dog-appeasing pheromone, is what the bitch secretes uh, you know, in this line of sebaceous gland by our nipples. That's why puppies lay so calmly together when they're nursing. For a cat, feel away is the cheek pheromone. The cats that rub you, rub the couch, that's a synthetic version of the feline cheek pheromone, which is kind of like the, 
the feline version of the good housekeeping seal of approval has been tested and approved, whether it's you or the corner of the couch. Uh, fetal and multi-cat is the, the cat appeasing pheromone. So it's what the queen has by her nipples that causes uh, uh, the kittens to be calm. That one in particular works much better if there's multiple cats. So feel away multi-cat, reduce visual stimuli, and if you have that music playing in that portable player, that's even better. That's called through All a dog's right. ear, cat's ear. <laughs> Thanks, Dr. Becker. Uh, here's our next question. What can we do to help a pet that comes into the hospital already terrified, as they might be after a trauma? Well, there's there's... Two times I can think of when you don't put emotional well-being first. If it's an emergency, that pet comes in, it's bloated, it's been, uh, you know, suffered a mauling or things, you have to do triage first. But for most pets, we look at, uh, you know, it's almost like the, the more, uh, you know, in, people ask me like in an emergency hospital, well, how do we do it? We don't know these pets. They can't give them any, uh, you know, they're not going to come in hungry, they're not going to get a chill pill. Well, what, what you tell people like that is, first of all, is, is keep yourself calm and don't baby talk the pet. In fact, you know, if it's my, my son or daughter and they had an accident, we'd send them an MP3 file with the music to play coming in. When they came in, on the table, there would be a pheromone impregnated warm towel or pad for the pet to, uh, whether it's on the exam table or on the floor. And we would use our things about, you know, averting gaze and how we interact with it. And and I had a I had a, a, a dog last Friday that it, that came in and it was doing fine until there was a clank in the back, and then all of a sudden it was just <laughs> just panting and pacing and circling. Well, in the old days, I would have just got two more texts and we'd have, we'd have got it done. We'd have, we'd have woman handled it and got it done. But I, I had three choices for this, for the owner here. One, we can call it a day. Let's just retreat. And there's some people that love to go to the vet and love to spend time, and for them there's no problem with them. Uh, you know, they want to come back another day because they want another excuse to come in and visit. Uh, this individual wasn't that person. You know, they'd taken time off work. They had, they had uh, you know, it was a big deal to come in. So now I'm left with two options. One is to go straight to sedation, you know, get the dexedomator out. The other one was to give it uh, uh, an, or, an anxiolytic orally and see if they could wait 15 to 30 minutes for it to take effect. So I gave some alprazolam, some generic Xanax. I went and saw another patient. And when I came back, the dog was just fine. So, you know, it's once you have the knowledge of this, you're, you're, you're going to find out so many of these dogs that were aggressive, so many of these cats that we had labeled a bad actor, they're just scared. And once you reduce fear, anxiety, and stress, I, I, can, tell you, I can tell you so many cats that they used to get a, a cage, a, shelter, a sign on the cage that said, caution, uh, um, uh, uh, fearful cat, you know, we'd have this thing, they're fractious cat, excuse me, caution fractious cat, and somebody get the welding gloves out and a big Costco towel to throw over it, that means there's a battle to be fought to protect us, and now it says caution fearful cat, that means there's a battle to be fought to protect this cat, that means it may come in on something, it may be put by itself with a, with a, a pheromone in the bottom, it may be listening to this music, um, you know, so... It's just so many. I can think of these cats that everybody you see it on the on the appointment schedule and go, oh no, not that one. And uh, and and now we'll have them in the in on the exam table and the cat's purring and rubbing up against you. Um, it's it's pretty amazing. And there's still some that are, you know, that are inherently dangerous. And you, it's not like you're never going to have a dog that you have to muzzle or you're never have to gonna do a real tight Pareto on some cats just to get necessary treatment in. But the vast majority, it's no longer a rodeo. It's no longer judo throws. It's just more well-choreographed dance of physical and emotional well-being. It looks like we have time for just one last question. So here it is. What fear-free methods would you recommend for a beagle 
who dreads his thyroid blood draw from his neck? Well, I can tell you how we've changed a bunch of these. Remember the, remember the I talked about at a zoo. You can't, you can't get six people to hold a rhino down to trim its feet. You can't get, um, you know, ten people to hold an elephant down to an otoscopic exam. You have to teach them to present themselves for services. That's one of the things we've learned from the zoo people is how do you teach an animal to present itself for service? So what I would do for this dog is we'd have to counter condition it. You'd have to uh, touch its neck, get a treat. Touch its neck again, get a treat. And hold the, you know, hold the syringe up by its neck and get a treat. And then do that over a period of time to where the whole thing, everything becomes, every part, just, just getting up on the table treat or just sitting on a towel treat and then doing the touching and then the thing. And so you counter condition them. There's very few animals that we have that used to be terrified of nail trims, terrified of blood draws, terrified of the, of getting down and having the ultrasound done, that now it's become something positive. So we've learned from these, uh, these experts and are bringing that to bear for the, for all these pets in shelters and hospitals. And with that last answer, we will be ending our event. We want to thank all of you for your time tonight and also a special thank you to Dr. Becker for a wonderful presentation. Don't forget to keep a lookout for the email with your 50% off discount code. And please check your spam folder if you don't receive one by tomorrow evening. You will have until December 14th, exactly one week from today, to use this code to register for the Fear Free course. The 10 lucky winners of the free scholarship will also be notified by email tomorrow morning. Make sure to save the date for our next webcast, The Breed ID Game, on January 19th with Kristen Arbach. This webcast will be available on demand shortly, and we hope you will share this presentation on social media. Thanks again for joining us this evening, and good night.